is RTV6 News at 7, working for you. Good evening at 7 o'clock. I'm Amanda Starantino. And I'm Mark Mullins. Churches on the southwest side of Indianapolis are out thousands of dollars thanks to thieves looking to cash in on valuable metals. And tonight we are taking a closer look at the toll recent thefts are taking on houses of worship. West Morris Free Methodist Church was targeted by thieves back in July. Seven air conditioning units were stolen, a financial toll of $30,000. The church was hit again at the end of last year. This time their AC units were taken along with catalytic converters off church vehicles. I'm saddened to hear that um, other churches have been targeted, but unfortunately not overly surprised. And in October, Chapel Hill United Methodist Church was also hit by a catalytic converter thief. Experts we spoke with say AC units and catalytic converters are valuable because of the valuable metals inside, like copper. Thieves often sell those metals for cash. The churches we spoke to say they're getting help through donations and talking to council members about cracking down on the crimes. And new today, we are getting a better idea of what led to the now former president of Franklin College getting arrested on child sex crime charges. Yeah, 56-year-old Thomas Minor was fired this week after the college learned of his arrest in a police sting operation in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Newly released court documents reveal a series of messages between Minor and who he believed to be a 15-year-old boy who was actually an officer. Police arrested Minor when he showed up to meet the boy he thought he was talking to, saying he only meant to mentor the boy. He is now charged with child enticement, use of a computer to facilitate a child sex crime, and exposing a child to harmful material. A Hendricks County School District is making changes to better address sexual misconduct. As Call 6 Investigates first told you, the federal government has launched a Title IX investigation into the Northwest Hendricks School Corporation. Call 6 Investigates' Kara Kenny joins us now with how the district is responding. Records I obtained show the Federal Office for Civil Rights is investigating whether the school district took reports of sexual harassment seriously and whether they retaliated against people who made those reports. After Call 6 Investigates broke the story about the federal investigation, it prompted some citizens to speak out at Tuesday's board meeting at Tri-West Middle School. Then he got on here and he just opposed the same sign, all in favor say aye, on and on and on. Don't care, don't care. Not my money, who cares? Well, maybe you'll care when the federal government steps in and jerks all your money away because you're not doing the right thing. Northwest Hendricks could lose federal funding if they're found in violation of Title IX, a law that bans discrimination in education based on sex. The district has faced criticism for how it has handled sexual misconduct allegations involving teacher Tyler Bruce. Bruce remains on paid administrative leave while the criminal investigation continues, and he denies the allegations. The district announced Tuesday it has taken steps to make sure it's complying with Title IX, including training for all district administrators administrators, joining a national group that helps schools with best practices, approving a Title IX coordinator for the district, and approving the use of safe schools training for all staff. The district is being very responsive in terms of taking a look at all the policies, not just the Title IX policies, which were discussed tonight, and of course have been um, of concern to a number of people, but all of the policies are being reviewed. So this is a start. The Northwest Hendricks School Corporation plans to review this complaint and respond to the federal government and follow any recommendations they might have. I'm Call 6 Investigates, Kara Kenny. Charges are on the way for students, teachers, and parents at three, excuse me, changes are on the way for students, parents, and uh, staff at three Indianapolis schools. The State Board of Education has voted to return control of three charter schools to Indianapolis public schools at the end of the school year. The district's long-term plan is to partner Manual High School with the education company Crystal House. Emma Donnan Middle School will be operated by a new company. Both schools will be accountable to the IPS board. Some parents say it's time to cut ties with the organization that has been running the schools for the last several years, but others are disappointed with today's decision. I think it's all political and it, it's sad. It's about money and politics and not about the kids. The third school that is now back under IPS control is TC Howe Community High School. Right now, the district plans to close Howe at the end of the school year. Now in the Storm Team 6 Tracking Center with Chief Meteorologist Kevin Gregory. Kevin, speaking of school, a lot of students had a delay this morning because of the fog, but 
I have a big announcement. No two-hour delays tomorrow morning. Okay. Yeah, the fog is no longer an issue. It's all about temperature here as we go through the next 24 hours. Notice the visibility as you get along the state line with Michigan is low, lower than central Indiana. We've got nothing to worry about. We're whipping things up with the wind. It's bringing in drier air and colder temperatures, also just mixing things up. And so that improves visibility at west, northwest at 15 in Indy now. We'll see some gusts over 20 miles per hour. Cooler to the north, it's only 40 in Peru. It is 51 in Bloomington, 48 in Terre Haute and Columbus. That warmer air drifting to the north, but it won't win out. Temperatures will be in the 20s in the morning. The bus will be on time in the morning. 26 is the temperature first thing in the morning. Afternoon high temperature just above the freezing mark. But this is what you really need to dress for. Wind chill temperatures that will be close to the single digits, certainly in the teens through the morning, warming into the lower 20s in the afternoon. Some sunshine is a part of a 34 degree high temperature that we expect in the afternoon. It's a big problem. RTV6 was first to report to you Tuesday. Several east side businesses are trying to catch a repeat thief that is stealing truck batteries and costing them thousands of dollars. Twice this week, Brian Holloway of Advanced Office Logistics says batteries have been stolen from their trucks. The thief has been caught on surveillance video multiple times driving in a two-tone van with a missing bumper. At least four other businesses have also caught the suspect in the act. Holloway says the thief got away with 12 batteries from his company in the last week. These batteries are showing up somewhere. You know, three brand new batteries got taken somewhere yesterday and turned in for a core charge of like 40 bucks a piece. And, you know, we're out $4,000 in a week on stolen batteries. Holloway says he hopes other businesses can team up and help get the suspect off the streets. If there is something going on in your home or community and you need help getting it fixed, connect with RTV6. Give us a call or send us a message at workingforyou at rtv6.com and we will see what we can do. A former deputy general counsel with the Indiana Department of Child Services has filed a lawsuit claiming DCS discriminated against her because she's a woman and violated the Equal Pay Act. Diana Mejia says DCS replaced her with a male employee who made more money despite having less experience in child welfare. Mejia says DCS retaliated against her and terminated her when she complained about it. She's seeking to be reinstated as well as lost wages and benefits. DCS declined to comment on this. Making women in the military more visible. We got an inside look at a photo shoot today meant to highlight the efforts of women veterans and their service. It's part of a national campaign called, quote, I am not invisible. Roughly 32,000 women veterans call Indiana home and the I am not invisible campaign aims to open Hoosier's eyes to how much those women contribute. One veteran said she had an invisible moment at the VA a couple years ago. She was waiting for a blood draw and a male veteran asked why she was there. And he said, no, really, why are you here? And I was rather stunned because to me that said, oh, you can't possibly be a veteran. Uh, you can't possibly be a disabled veteran, which I am. And I feel like a lot of female veterans have this issue. We're invisible, not only to the civilian population, but to other veterans as well. The photo shoot was hosted by the Indiana Department of Veterans Affairs and the Veterans Affairs Center for Women Veterans. Investing in the teachers of Indiana was one of the themes of Governor Eric Holcomb's fourth State of the State address. Tonight, we're getting reaction from two people hoping to unseat Holcomb in this fall's election. Holcomb's agenda includes taking steps to improve teacher pay. He is recommending that in the next budget year, 2021, the General Assembly uses an additional $250 million from the state's surplus and put it toward teacher retirement funds. In turn, $50 million a year will be generated to redirect to teacher pay. But two men hoping to secure the governor's seat say that plan is too little too late. We've got to act now. Um, even though it's not a budget year, there, there are no rules that say we can't do something if we think that the situation warrants it. And I, I think 15,000 folks uh, dressing in their best, brightest red to get attention at the State House is sufficient to get attention uh, this year, not in future sessions. His response is uh, lackluster. Uh, it is a delayed response. It's not nearly what we need. Um, in fact, it, as a candidate for governor, one of the biggest things that I proposed uh, right from the start was a fully funded plan to put uh, $300 million a year into public education. 
And coming up in just a few moments, leaders are exploring whether using foreign parts in U.S. voting machines could put our election integrity at risk, why using paper ballots may not be any safer. Plus, a little later on, blue light glasses are supposed to protect your eyes from computer screen damage. But do they really work? We find out whether they actually are worth the money. Still ahead when RTV6 News at 7 continues. RTV6 is working for you. Lawmakers want to know if foreign parts and voting machines could be putting the U.S. elections at risk for hacking. Ashar Kouarshi is explaining how legislators are seeking answers from top bosses at three major voting manufacturers. We've seen no evidence that any of our voting systems have been tampered with in any way. The companies that make vote tabulation systems say they welcome federal oversight of election infrastructure and need help securing their supply chains, especially for voting machine parts made in foreign countries. Uh, several of those components, to our knowledge, are not even, there, there's no option for manufacturing uh, of those in the United States. Cyber and national security experts say antiquated and paperless voting machines pose the most significant risk to election infrastructure. It's simply beyond the state of the art to build software systems that can reliably withstand targeted attack by a determined adversary. In the wake of Russian meddling in the 2016 election, Congress is pumping nearly a billion dollars into making voting machines safer. We're definitely in a much better position today than we were at the end of 2016. There's Liz Howard is an attorney with the nonprofit, nonpartisan Brennan Center for Justice in Washington. She testified at last week's hearing. No machine is 100% secure. Election officials' goal is to make the most resilient election system that they possibly can. Some are calling for regular election audits, more resources for state voting officials, and the phasing out of all paperless voting machines. The Brennan Center estimates only about half of the states that used paperless voting machines in 2016 will continue to use them in 2020. Requiring a paper ballot, asserts some, is the only way to have a reliable backup of each vote. We absolutely need to have a paper record of every vote cast, right? Um, and that is a foundational election security measure. With top U.S. intelligence officials warning that foreign powers like Russia and Iran are intent on undermining U.S. elections, experts say there is at least widespread agreement that election security is national security. I'm Asha Qureshi reporting. Coming up here, don't you wish you could just sit back and relax as a form of exercise? Well, apparently certain movies can have that effect on your heart. Why watching films can help take care of your ticker. My heart rate is not elevated at this point. If wintry mix of snow and some freezing rain elevates your heartbeat, that could be the case Friday night. We'll finish this talk about what it changes to for Saturday coming up. Because we believe in fresh for everyone. This is RTV6 News at 7, working for you. Today marked the groundbreaking on a $20 million project that will bring more housing and entertainment to downtown. The Anthony M. Foundation and developer Dan Jacobs will mark the start of construction on Block 20. That project is being built on what is now a parking lot on East Street that sits next to the Anthony M. Block 20 will have 77 apartment units, restaurant space, and a parking garage with 252 spaces. There will also be an alleyway that will be used to showcase public art. We say parking, we all perk up. Right. right. We, love we, love parking. we like parking. And the parking has been easier this winter when you don't have a bunch of spots dedicated to a pile of snow. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. We may see some snow Friday night. It should be melting quickly thereafter. All right, we're dry tomorrow. That's the good news. We already talked about the fog situation improving. Not an issue tonight or tomorrow morning. Rain chances and wintry mix as we go Friday into Saturday really becomes a rain event. Saturday, I'd say Friday evening and Friday night, snow, some potential freezing rain and sleet before changing over to all rain. I just show you the timing on this cloudy Friday night. That's the gray. There's your thin band of moisture arriving in the form of snow may mix with some sleet or freezing rain. Warmer air will push in overnight and push then that wintry mix north of a Lafayette to Richmond line first thing in the morning. The rainfall will continue through the morning. 
before the warmer air arrives. Some of the snowfall may accumulate just a bit, certainly an inch or less, it looks like, around the metro area. A little more northern portions of the state will, it will take longer, and the warmer air may actually never reach that far north. Then the door is open. Hello, Canada. This is what happens as we go into the weekend. Temperatures by Sunday plunging as the nose of the cooler air arrives, and that's just the leading edge, which means settle in because Monday and Tuesday temperatures will be in the teens as well. If it's cold in the morning, you know it'll be cold in the afternoon. Temperatures only recover back into the 20s. Tomorrow, uh, we can hope for some sunshine. I think we hope for and get some sunshine in the afternoon. Temperature of about 34, but with the wind gusting to 20 miles per hour or stronger, it will feel colder. Thursday high temperatures closer to average for this time of year. Certainly going to feel more like January. Saturday's temperature will peak early in the day, most likely in the morning hours, strong south wind with rain around. The front goes through and the door opens to the colder temperatures and we tumble all the way into the low 20s on the Sunday. There's a strong wind I was mentioning and then it turns into a colder strong wind out of the west later in the day. Rainfall potential, three quarters of an inch to an inch of rain Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week. We start to climb above average by the time we get to the middle of next week. Here's your seven-day forecast. Relaxing day tomorrow, albeit cold. Gets more interesting Friday night into Saturday morning before we make the complete transition to all rain, then dry. It's been a while since we've had a four-day dry stretch like that, but that's what we have on the menu Sunday through Wednesday of next week. Enjoy it, but bundle up out there. Yeah. You're gonna need to. All right, thanks, Kevin, for that. It may feel like you're always looking at a computer, and with sore and dry eyes, people are looking for help, including buying blue light filtering glasses. Annie Taylor is finding out if these lenses are actually worth your money. From your smartphone to your TV, computer, or tablet, we pretty much stare at a screen most of our day. Every day I get people in here saying that their vision gets blurry or their eyes get really dry and burn a lot by the end of the day. Ophthalmologist Lauren Zimsky says there's a reason for that. When people sit at a computer, they blink about half the amount of times that they would normally blink. That's why so many of her patients ask about a new trend, blue light filtering glasses. You can find them at eyeglass counters, online, and at big box stores, costing anywhere from $15 up to $100. Blue is just a particular wavelength of light that has um, been shown to basically keep you awake during the day. Zimsky says you might see claims that the glasses prevent eye strain, but is that true? There's a lot of good research that shows that if you wear blue blocking glasses before bedtime when you're looking at a digital device that you will fall asleep easier. But if you're sitting in an office all day, there's no real evidence that shows that it helps with eye strain during the day at the computer. However, for those addicted to their devices, what does this ultimately mean? I do have patients that feel like they do help with eye strain at the computer. So you can certainly try them, but they may or may not make a difference. I'm Annie Taylor reporting. Okay, so your Fitbit won't like this, but a small study has found a pretty enjoyable alternative to exercise. Yeah, researchers in London say that going to a movie has the same effect on heart rate as 40 minutes of light exercise. <laughs> they also observed that the audience members' heart rates seem to sync up during the show. It appears concentration is key here. They only noticed this connection in people who actually went to a theater. It doesn't seem to be true of watching a movie at home, and they suspect that's a result of having too many distractions at home. What if you add popcorn? <laughs> Can't wait to it tell my gym it. about yeah. this one. They're going to love that. Well, still ahead, they're like your children. That's right, and there's a huge market for creating items, especially for people's pets. A new form of entertainment lined up for your animal friends. You're watching RTV6. We'll leave you now with a live look from our Weather Now camera downtown. Time to donate to Goodwill. 
Welcome back. Our TV 6s Hiring Hoosiers is our passion project that looks for all sorts of ways for you to be happy at work. So today we're scoping out the best jobs of 2020, and if you plan on looking for a new one, consider getting into the technology field. Career site Glassdoor just released its annual list of the best jobs. Seven out of the top 10 were in technology. Front-end engineer topped the list. That's basically a web developer who designs the look and feel of a website. Glassdoor based its ranking on criteria like job satisfaction, average salary, and the number of openings. Healthcare jobs also scored well. Speech pathologist ranks number eight and nursing manager is number 11 on that list. And while you're at work, here's something fun to keep your pets happy while you're away. Spotify has created several playlists and a podcast is just for pets who are left home alone. The podcast is filled with messages of encouragement and praise meant to soothe any anxiety a pet might have during the day. And for the animals who enjoy their alone time, they offer playlists designed to match different personalities. Spotify currently has options for dogs, cats, iguanas, birds, and hamsters. Well, obviously, Leo just loves Taylor Swift because that's usually what's on. <laughs> but I have used. Has he told you that? <laughs> I can just tell. But I've used these Spotify playlists before for him because I can control it from my Alexa on and my phone while I'm here. How's he reacting? I come home and he's nice and relaxed. I love that. So she try it with Rory and Bishop. It's been <laughs> Bishop, tested. Bishop listen to classical, I think. <laughs>